Welcome to another episode of the Chicks on the Right podcast, where we talk to our BFF and sponsor of the show, Zach Abraham, who is the chief investment officer at Bulwark Capital Management. And he always helps us understand weird, complicated financial monetary concepts, and he breaks them down into little tidbits that we can understand. And it's good timing, Zach, because apparently the GDP has soared uh, unexpectedly to new heights that were not foreseen. And so that begs the question, what the hell is that? And what does that really mean? <laughs> what is GDP yeah. anyway? What is that? Huh? Yeah, okay, so, so GDP stands for gross domestic product. Okay, so w what it basically is looking at is trying to, and, and to add on to what you said, we, we, we try to do this all the time, but it's not about breaking it into little pieces. It's just about putting it in layman's terms, right? Like you, one of the things you learn about the world of finances, everybody knows more than they think they do. They just don't know the lingo, right? Like, okay. it, 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 well, we, like you, you, people know the concepts. And I, I, and I am convinced to this day that the reason that there's so much of this esoteric vernacular used is just so we sound smart, right? Like it, <laughs> You, you, you know what I mean? Because you'll hear these people say this big elaborate thing and you're like, so what you're saying is we've got too much debt, right? <laughs> and, and, and it literally, and, and you, it literally it took like a paragraph and five minutes to say it, you know? So, um, so gross domestic product is, is just basically, it's, it's a very rudimentary, very inaccurate kind of think of it like a sledgehammer way to measure the output of an economy. So th this is way over simplistic, but it really does. You don't need to dig into it deep to really understand. It basically is looking at the sums or, or, or the additions and subtractions and, and basically adding up all transactions, right? And saying, okay, that sum of that transaction, that is an output, right? Apple sold, you know, <clears throat> it's, yeah, 30 million phones internationally. That goes on our gross domestic product, right? So it's it's just adding so how do they the pick? Number. Like how what does that? it? Who well? How do you pick what goes into the measurement and who's responsible for doing the tallying? Yes, yeah, and like, like a, is there like a GDP czar? Like who does <laughs> no, that? It's it's, it, <laughs> it's 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 done different. Yeah, different people, different people, um, different industries tab or excuse me, different departments. It, tabulated everybody kind of keeps track of it on their own the federal reserve tabulates it on their own um i believe the bls the bureau of labor statistics i believe they tabulate gdp on their own but it comes from but but the but the official numbers come from fred or uh, and i forget what the acronym stands for but it's the federal um it's like the federal data department basically it's fred the federal something economic department the federal uh, regulatory not, or something it might be the federal reserve economic department reserve okay publishing, we're gonna go with that the exact data I, I i've looked at it so long i just see fred on the charts and i that's how i <laughs> identify but yeah so but here's the tricky part about it right and here's one of the things that i think is going on and i and i don't think it's conspiratorial i i just we've talked about before about the tricky inflation is a very tricky thing that most people know far less about than they think they do Right. It, 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 there's just different forms of inflation. There's different causes of inflation. So one of the tricky things about GDP is that GDP, there's two different ways to tabulate it. There's what we call nominal GDP, which is literally just the addition. An easy way to put it is an addition of all transactions made in an economy over any given period of time. OK, so total economic output, just adding all of it up together. How many widgets did the entire economy sell? How many buildings did it build? Adding it all up together, putting it out there. That's the nominal number. And then what we look at in the business and what Fred, the Federal Reserve Economics Department, and all these guys, what, what they put out is something called real GDP. So that is the nominal growth number less the inflation rate. So one of the things that I have been saying is, you know, and you talk to people out there, yeah, you see these economic prints. Does it feel like you're in an economy that's growing at three to five percent? And everybody's answer is unequivocally no. Right. Now, I could be wrong about this, but I think the easy explanation for all of it is that inflation is understated. Because if inflation is understated, that will make GDP look bigger, right? Because we take the nominal number less the inflation rate. So, if we had five and a half to six percent inflation right now, 
I think that that would make a lot more sense. That would imply that the economy was growing at like more like 0.5 to 1%, or, uh, uh, or uh, in other words, just hanging off the edge of recession. And I think that's actually what's going on. So, I, I, and again, I don't think it's conspiratorial. I don't think anybody's trying to do it. I think that there are things that the Federal Reserve does that makes them prone to understate inflation. I think that there are things that have, you know, you've had a lot of one-off crazy things occur economically in the last three years. I think that's kind of clouding the issue to some degree. But I, I, you look at all this data, it looks all conflicting like it doesn't make sense. Mm. Then you look at the, then if you assume that the inflation rate is understated, bump it up to five and a half to six, now everything makes a lot more sense. So that's kind of why we think that what, what's going on and what's really confusing people is inflation is being structurally understated, which is making growth look stronger than it really is. So I, again- But I, not I, on I, purpose? You're saying inflation is not being, it's being understated, but not on purpose? Y- yes and no. Except, okay, for so, by the, except for by the Biden administration, because they're going to understate it what? on purpose, with purpose. Oh, well, they, I mean, they're, they're, he's already <laughs> going to tell you there's no inflation and we've beat it, right? Right, so, right. totally. It's you know, transitory. So, yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah, you got to <laughs> love that word. So yeah. so the answer the answer is yes and no. Okay? So if you go back and look at over the years, the Federal Reserve has made several tweaks to how it how it measures inflation. Okay? Now, I think it's impossible not to observe that every one of those tweaks made inflation lower, not higher. Okay? So now I think it's also impossible to to not observe the fact that understating inflation structurally is beneficial to both elected officials and the Federal Reserve. So is there a part of that at play? Yes, I'm sure. Then there's also, though, a part of it that's not. And it's something that they do. And I, I think we've talked about this before, but it's something that the Fed does called hedonic adjustments. So what a hedonic adjustment is, and a, and a, I've got two really good examples for what it is and what it isn't. Okay. So, and the Fed, here's the problem. The Fed does this to both things. If we look at automobiles and, and I, I can't remember the, I can't remember the date, but if you look at the Fed's data, the Fed will tell you that the cost of automobiles, and again, I don't remember the exact dates, but it's over a 25 year period of time. So let's say 1980 to 2005, the Fed will tell you that there was zero automobile inflation. Okay, now, if what? you look at the price of automobiles over that period of time, they went from like 3,500 to like 35,000. Okay. Right. Now, what the Fed's, now, the Fed's argument is this. Their argument is now, okay, at the same time, now, now keep that in your mind, what we're talking about with automobiles. Now, think about cell phones. Let's go back and look at what the average family was paying for telephone bills in 1980 and look what they're paying now. Okay. Cell phones are why the Fed does hedonic adjustments. If you look at what people were paying for a telephone bill in 1980 compared to what families are paying today, it's mind blowingly more, right? Mm-hmm. But think about what use we get out of that telephone bill that we didn't then. We're using it for GPS. We're using it to GPS locate our kids. We're using it to email and conference call and FaceTime and take pictures and videos and all these other things, right? So to say that the cell phone, it, the cost of phones inflated a thousand percent, it wouldn't be accurate because phones are serving so many more purposes today than they were in 1980. Okay, okay, but here's fair. the problem. Yeah. Flip back to the automobile. Okay, the automobile isn't giving us a service today that it wasn't in 1980. True. What is the primary function of the automobile? It's to get you from one place to the other. Well, guess what? Cars aren't any better at doing that today than they were in 1980. I think they're worse. Yeah, well, you could certainly make, <laughs> you could certainly make that argument, especially if you drive an electric vehicle, specifically right. one made by Tesla. Uh-huh. Right? Uh, but no, but, but I, no, but I agree with you. But so, so that's a classic example though of bureaucratic, uh, um, um, you know, oversights where they don't think about unintended consequences, right? Where you're like, yeah, 
I can see how Adonic adjusting would, 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 would deal with cell phones and that gives you a more accurate picture. But on the other hand, you're doing that same thing to a bunch of, and their argument is, well, but look at all the things you've got seat heater or seat heaters and you've got stereo systems and moon roofs. And I go, yeah, but that doesn't improve the underlying no. intended function of the car. It Not doesn't get all. me to work faster. It doesn't improve my margins. Mm -mm. It doesn't you're just more comfortable. To spend, yeah, That's it. It doesn't allow me to spend more time with my family. Right. So, so that is just pure inflation, right? It's just mm -hmm. pure inflation. So when you look at that side of it, I think it's really hard to argue that inflation <laughs> is not materially understated because of things like that. And like I said, when you see a, a, a GDP print like that, that everybody's like, oh, it's growing. And you're like, hey, find me anybody out there that would say that they feel like the economy is growing at that pace. Nobody right. does, right? So then you look at it and go kind of Occam's razor. You go, hey, of all these things, what makes sense? Well, if inflation is materially understated, that would mean growth is materially overstated. That's, that seems to fit, right? So that's kind of, I, I hope I didn't give you guys more questions and answers on that. <laughs> but I, I just, I think that that's what's happening. And I think that there's a real danger in that as far as the economy is concerned, because it's going to make the economy appear much stronger than it actually is. Mm -hmm. And I think, I am not sure, but I think that is starting to unravel as we speak. Meaning you're not there yet, but you see all of the things lined up for a lot of job losses in a relatively short period uh. of time. We, guys, this, and th to, be to be fair though, this environment is extraordinarily complex and there's so many cross currents that you can't be, a, the only thing I'm sure of really in this environment is that the guy that, can tell, that, that tells you that he knows exactly how it's gonna play out, the only thing I'm sure of is he's a complete idiot or a liar, <laughs> right? That, that, it really, I just, I just know that it's, a, it's an environment where the market is telling you there's no risk, there's tons of it, right? And I, it's just an environment that requires a lot of caution because there's just so many false flags and there's so much conflicting data, so much confusion, but the underlying health of things is not good. Um, the, you know, every single day interest rates stay up here. You're going to see, remember we, we told you guys a couple months ago, we're like, wait, things are going to get really weird. You're going to start seeing the market do really well. And you're going to see data start picking up a little bit and everybody's going to be like, oh, it's great. Here we are. Right. This yeah. is exactly what we were looking for. So it, it's, it's going to be a complicated environment, but man, these commercial, we just heard about BlackRock had a big uh, property default that was worth 175 uh, million bucks. So th those, those commercial office space defaults are coming. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, okay. So that's helpful. And this is exactly why you do the seminars that you do, why you do your little um, short radio bits all the time. And this is why people should connect with you. How can they do that? Yeah. So, well, shoot, the easiest way today is we've got our, uh, our live roadshow webinar deal uh, today at 3.30 Pacific Standard Time. If you want to go for that, or if you want to uh, get a link to that, it's on Zoom. You don't have to participate. You just sit back. We run you through who we are, what we do, how we do it for about 45 minutes, and then do a Q&A session at the end. You can ask me anything from, you know, stocks to currency questions to Bitcoin, whatever the, whatever the deal is. And do you, um, do, the, do you do those seminars monthly? How often do you do those? We, we do them every six weeks. Every six it, it, weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's free of charge. Just go to no, uh, bulwarkcapitalmanagement.com or knowyourriskradio.com and little prompt comes right up. You just sign up for it. We'll email you the link right before the webinar starts. And if you're interested, you can sign up to talk to one of our advisors or talk to me afterwards. If not, hopefully you leave with more information, you know, so awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank Fantastic. you, Zach. Once Thanks again, a bunch, you're Zach. always so helpful. All right. Thank you, ladies. Have a great one. We'll see you soon. You okay. Too. Bye.